Thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Business of Fun podcast. I am your host, Dave Wakeman. My episode today is brought to you by my friends at Booking Protect, the global leaders in refund protection. To find out how you and your organization can partner with Booking Protect to offer your customers a better buying experience, more peace of mind, and you can create a new revenue stream for your organization, visit them at www.bookingprotect.com. Booking Protect, the global leaders in refund protection. If you are listening to this, because it is going to be dropping on Wednesday, March 20th, uh, over the next two days, you'll be able to find Booking Protect at Stand 12 at the Ticketing Professionals Conference in Birmingham, England. You'll also want to keep in mind that you should be constantly checking the Booking Protect blog. Uh, we are starting to produce some really great content about trends, um, ideas for uh, managing, accelerating the buying process for your customers, uh, a lot of things about uh, conversions and remarketing and all these things that are really valuable um, and that are useful from partnering with Booking Protect and understanding the data that they have available. And you can also find that at www.bookingprotect.com and click through um, and click on the blog button. My guest today is Lawrence Purrier at Light. Uh, Lawrence is someone I'm very, very excited to talk to. Uh, I met Lawrence at Intix in Dallas this year, and I was like, my God, I've been following you on Twitter for years, and I follow you on LinkedIn. And then after the fact, Lawrence reached out to me, um, and I was like, well, and I felt like I was a big doofus compared to Lawrence because Lawrence is like such a smart guy, uh, such a great, like thoughtful person about all things tickets. Um, so I was like, really excited to talk to him, and we talk about a lot on this episode. We talk about what lights up to, right? Um, we talk about um, how the product that they, he works on uh, cuts the no-show rates from maybe 15 or 20 percent down to one to two percent. Um, we talk about how that's possible. We talk about how that generates that kind of stuff generates revenue. We talk about the secondary market. We talk about um, you know what your expectations will be. We talk about you know product integrations. We talk about um, some really cool stuff as far as light goes. But then we get into some other stuff that that's even like more fun, which is like. Um, Lawrence was involved with um, the licensing program and creating virtual goods for Pink Floyd, and, and I thought that was really great. Um, I'm not even sure, I, but it, he was also involved in doing some stuff around one of David Bowie's albums, which I don't know that we even got to talk to on here. Uh, we talked a little bit about Taylor Swift. We talked about uh, festivals. We talked about his time in Amazon Music, or I mean Amazon Tickets, I'm sorry. Um, we, it was just like a really, really... Uh, great and like all over the place conversation with me and Lawrence Purrier on the business of fun. I want to welcome Lawrence Purrier to the business of fun podcast. Lawrence, what's happening? Hey, good morning. How are you? I'm good, man. I, I, um, I'm excited to have you. Uh, as I told you at Intix, I am a longtime Twitter follower of yours. <laughs> so, so then it was you funny to see you. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, I, I was probably like the only person geeking out on you at <laughs> Intix. And I was like, oh, I follow you on Twitter. It's awesome. <laughs> well, I've been so self-conscious about it ever since because I'm like, that's my cranky old man persona. I, I definitely have my Twitter persona, um, and it's 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 outrage and uh, t Twitter just, I guess like everybody else, it doesn't bring out my best side all the time. <laughs> it's true. I, I try to be better at it now because I know that there's a lot of people, um, you know, that pay attention to me. Well, this was shocking to me that people paid attention to me. Um, so I was like, I, I got to put a, do a little bit better job of putting a fun or f uh, public face on things instead of being a grumpy old man or like taking the piss out of people just because they're saying something or doing something stupid because yeah. it doesn't do me any good. So, so I was like, yeah, you know, I've, I've learned to moderate my Twitter habit just a touch. Just well, I've got something to learn from you. So thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, no, the, the, so I'm happy to teach you what, what, what little I know. Um, but I want to, I'm, I'm excited to talk about light because that's where you, you're at now. And it is a kind of a, it seems to me a product that is um, in line with somebody, you know, my friends at Booking Protect, right? And what you're working on there is it seems that you want to give people an opportunity if they are bought a ticket to a sold out experience 
and they don't remember they want to go or they can't go or something comes in the way to have a way to get rid of that ticket so that it doesn't go unused. Um, Can you explain to everybody, because I'm not sure if everybody even has heard of Light yet. Can you give us a little overview about what you're working on right now? Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, So I'm the head of business and corporate development at Light. It's spelled L-Y-T-E for those of you following along at home. And um, Light really offers two functionalities um, for concert goers or event attendees. One is when an event uh, or a price level in an event sells out and is no longer available in the primary on sale, a wait list goes up on the official website for the event. And what that means is fans can then come in and instead of seeing a sold out button that leads nowhere, um, it'll say sold out, but you could still get tickets or sold out, sign up for the wait list. And when you're registering for the wait list, a couple of things happen. You get presented a price, which is a bit more than the primary on sale price, but less than the then current secondary prices. So our system is monitoring the secondary system and pricing just below the secondary. So the official website can always say it has the cheapest prices. Um, and then you accept the price, give us your credit card, and you now have a reservation. The second thing that happens is the return functionality goes live. So an email goes out to all the ticket buyers and it says, hey, thanks so much for buying a ticket. If you can't go to the show or if your plans change, come back to the official website and we'll give you a refund. And Light buys tickets back to people who need to return them and we sell them to people on the wait list. And sort of that right there is Light 101. So it's a way for people who can't use their tickets to make them available to people people who really want to go. Yeah, that's, it's, it's an interesting concept to me because before we started talking about it, we talked about like a lot of the really positive things that can happen when you offer a product like light. And then as you were you're explaining the, the process of and how it works for people who wouldn't understand it, it brought up a bunch of questions. My, my first one is I think I know the answer, but I want to ask it the question anyway, so that people who are listening who might be like, well, how do I do this? Um, understand it's just an API integration, right? Like you already are integrated with like some of your partners. Is that correct or no? Yeah, that's a great question. So a big part of my job is going around to primary ticketing companies and doing these API integrations so that functionally a few things happen. When you want to return your ticket, the process as a user is you enter in the barcode or whatever the unique identifier is. And our system talks to the ticketing company in the background and says, hey, is this a real ticket? <laughs> and when the system replies and says yes, that allows us to process the refund. So we give you your money back, we take the ticket, and then we talk to the ticket system a second time and we say, hey, restrict this ticket. And restrict basically means cancel it, make sure it won't work when somebody shows up at the door with it. And then when we sell the ticket to the next person on the wait list, they get issued a brand new ticket from the primary ticketing company the same as everybody else's ticket. Um, So what that does is it avoids the problem of two people showing up at the door with the same ticket. So the the returned ticket is basically ripped up and thrown away and a new ticket's printed for the new customer. No, that's that's helpful because one of, and the reason I ask it, maybe this helps, is because what I found over the years is that a lot of people wanted to try these new things and try new ideas. So I want to, as much as possible, help them understand you know, the simple steps. So, you, you, so asking you that question was my way of helping people understand that, like, you know, working with somebody like light the same way as, you know, as I mentioned before, book and protect it's integrated into your software packages in most places so that like, it makes it simple for you. And unless there's some kind of catastrophic failure, it's like, you can forget it. You can set it and forget it. Just like, uh, was it, uh, Will Pompey, Ron, Ron Pompey, to set it and forget it. So No, I think that that's a, that's a fair way to say it. In fact, that's manifested in the way some of the ticketing companies then go to market with their clients because a lot of them simply, um, they handle the sales process on our behalf. They go to their individual venues or festivals or event partner clients and say, hey, we have a new feature of our platform. There's nothing you really have to do except say yes. Right. So I think that that's a fair, how you described it is dead on. Yeah. You know? And, and another interesting thing you brought up was about the secondary pricing so that the official website could always have the most competitive pricing. Mm-hmm. I get how, you know, how and why you monitor the secondary market for the pricing. One of the things, though, is like if you're a consumer that is not necessarily going to be able to make it to a show 
what is the incentive to sell the ticket on light as opposed to sell it on maybe uh, StubHub or you know, Ticketmaster Plus or any of the other uh, markets? Because you know you maybe make a couple bucks if you sell it on the secondary market yourself. Yeah, no, that's a very that's a very fair question. I think there's two answers, and one one answer is a, a, I'll call it a softer one, and it's how you can see how some of our partners position light. So if you go to the Mumford and Sons website, for example, they do a really good job of saying to their fans, "Look, we don't like the situation in ticketing. Um, it can be a scary marketplace. You know, it's it's there's price gouging, there's fraud." Um, do the right thing. If you can't use your ticket, we found these guys light, use them because it's better for the community. Help us solve the problem. We can't solve it alone. So there's a, there's a fan community aspect to it, but I think more practically speaking, it's just, you want to return your ticket. And I bought my ticket. The festival is six months from now. My wife got pregnant. I changed jobs. I moved a lot of life happens in six months. And some people just want their money back. They don't want to deal with Venmo and Craigslist and StubHub and meeting somebody at a bar and they work all day. Like they, they just want to return their ticket. And I think that that's the piece of the market. There's, you know, there's 10, 15, 20% of event attendees that that's just what they need and want to do. And it's a, um, it's the same, it's the same version of set it and forget it that the venue gets. The customer just gets a way to walk back up to the official website, enter in their barcode, and get their money back and be done with it. Yeah, the and this is going to come become strange or sound strange to some of the people listening to this podcast. Uh, but the the Mumford and Sons example is speaks to me, right, in my point of view on some of this stuff because a lot of the bands and performers and acts that are going to most benefit from something like Light. This is my opinion, are going to benefit, are going to be bands who are in a position like Mumford and Sons or um, Ed Sheeran or Pearl Jam or any of those bigger bands who are going to sell out their shows no matter what, right? They, they don't need the assistance of the secondary market to help them sell a ticket. Um, they can sell a ticket. And the community aspect of going to their shows is such a big thing, right? And, I, and as, as you were talking about Mumford and Sons, I was like, when, when I go to, when I travel to go see Pearl Jam shows, that, that community is there, right? Like there's Facebook groups where people are like, you know, here is face value. You know, I just want to make sure you can get in brother. And that's, you know, it's really yeah. like, you know, like just like the grateful dead kind of thing. Um, you know, so that's really, I think an important thing because it also highlights a, a thing that I think we need to be more conscious of in entertainment is the fact that these shows and these events are community. And I think by inspiring and encouraging the community aspect of it, I think it has probably has a real host of positive um, unintended consequences. One of which I know that we talked about before, and I, you know, I would be failing in my job of hosting this or um, knowing how people make money in a lot of cases was the no show policy and how it's had an impact on your customers as far as not just reducing the number of no shows, but I would call it a radical reduction in no show rates. I want you to explain it because I I don't know that I would do it justice because the the numbers are like they're really awesome. Yeah, and they're and they're and they're real and they're repeatable and they are consistent across events whether it's a 200 seat room or a 80,000 seat festival and what you're alluding to is the fact that even when an event sells out um it's not uncommon at all. In fact, it's very common to only see maybe 80, 85% of the people walk through the turnstiles. So there's 15, 20 percent of the people that bought tickets and they just never show up. Um, and that's been a that's been a, 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 a consistent problem, like I said, across event types, but also across years. And it just gets factored into the, the way a lot of venues do business and how they think about their business. And so what happens with light is what we truly are seeing is that that 15 percent of the people, those are the light customers. They're the ones that return their tickets. They they now have a solution that doesn't force them to go to Craigslist or go to a, a third party marketplace. They don't want to be small business people with their tickets. They just want to return them. And this gives them a way to do that. The other side of that is there's all this demand sitting there on the wait list of people who really want to go to the show but got shut out. Now they buy those tickets. They can use them. <laughs> and what we find and what we're seeing with our clients is they're saying now there's one or two percent no show rates. Um, 
And that's phenomenal because what you and I talked about before, and which you know from your background, all those people are coming in and maybe they're paying for parking, which the venue participates in, or they're buying T-shirts that the band and the venue participates in, or they're buying food and beverage, which is where the margin is for so many of these small business owners. And you can really do the math. If it's, you know, if your per head is five, 10, 20, 30 bucks a night, and even a small club's getting another 20 or 30 people in there a show, and you multiply that across a couple of hundred shows a year, it starts to become real money. Not only that those people get to put in their pocket, but that they get to put back into their patron experience, that they get to put back into business expansion. And quite honestly, a lot of them are putting it back into town. They're pricing all this new revenue into the offers they make the artists. So in a very cool roundabout way, helps the artists make more money too. So I can be very accused of like being overly enthusiastic on this, on this point, but it's an amazing impact on the ecosystem that we love to see happen. It's just, it's really cool. Yeah, no, I, I realized that as we were doing this, I was like, going, wow, this is like, um, I don't want this to sound like I'm doing an advertisement for light because I mean, you know, I try not to ever be like, you know, so product centric um, in the way I ask questions or things. But I was like, this is fantastic. When you take, you know, you increase your, you cut your no shows by like 85 or 90% or more. And you think about the numbers because I mean, we were just throwing numbers out and simple ones It pretty quickly can become a quarter million, a half million, a million dollars. And then when you get the big shows, millions and millions of dollars very, very quickly. And if you're operating on very thin margins, that's the difference between, you know, staying in business and going out of business or being able to produce the event annually or just having it be a one-off thing. I mean, it, it really is that powerful. And it's, you know, it's something that I try to like really preach for people is like being creative in the ways that you look for and find revenue because, it's, you know, creativity is really the limit to how, how you find your revenue. And, you know, just getting people in the door is like the number one way to make more money. And, you know, solving that problem is, is just unbelievable. Yeah, it's exciting. And, and, and the, the other, the, there's a couple of smaller corollaries to that, which is um, we have like what I would call statistically zero churn rate um, on, on the client side. There may be clients that left, but I can't name any. Um, and certainly um, none of our larger partners or, or larger venues. Like once, once you start using light, um, it's, a, it's a feature that you don't want. First of all, you don't want to take it away from your customers because that's just awkward. But um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's I give it to you. I can't take it away. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's a, it's a solution that's working for their businesses because, I mean, let's just be pragmatic. If it wasn't working for their businesses, they wouldn't keep it going. Um, and for customers, the most amazing thing is once you use light once or twice, you start to expect it. And that's been a very interesting phenomenon. Like our customer service team gets these inquiries and says, oh, you know, I used light to buy my tickets to the Bottle Rock Festival and it was so awesome. I have tickets to Justin Timberlake and I can't go. Can I return my tickets? Or why can't I return my tickets? Why doesn't this work at every venue? So um, there's a nice... There's a nice groundswell on both the client side and the fan side. Um, that's sort of super fun to be in the middle of. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it really is. It's, I mean, we were talking about design thinking and how that like maybe uh, should apply more to the entertainment industry before. And this is, you know, this just fits right in because we have to be more customer focused, right? And The thing is, by being more customer focused, we're just incentivizing people to do what they want to do anyway, which is spend money on experiences. So, you know, who am I to say, hey, look, I'd love for you to spend money on my experience, but let me make you jump through a lot of hurdles. How about let me make less hurdles so you'll just give me more of your money? I mean, that's really what this is. And that's what I was excited about. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, Making making it easy and adding value. Yeah. that's, That's the key. Adding value. Now, another thing that you worked on, so that I doesn't, so I can't be accused of doing a infomercial for light, even though I think that the product's great. Um, and every, if I ever put any my name behind some of these endorsements, 
I truly do believe this. Lawrence is not paying me, um, even though you'll probably buy me a drink the next time we see each other, but that's fine. <laughs> is one of, I was doing some research, and I saw that you worked on something that I thought was awesome, uh, which was Pink Floyd's uh, digital merchandise rights. Uh, yeah. And, and, yeah. and I, I mentioned I wanted to ask that because I was like, this is fantastic. This is like really cool. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Yeah. So people who've known me for a while or in my professional life will know that I went through this brief but intense obsession with virtual goods um, <laughs> around 10 or so years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, I was just obsessed with the notion of, um, you know, uh, in-game commerce and um, customization. Um, but also it really came from my background in, um, you know, to give you just two seconds of context, my my career has sort of always lived at the intersection of artists and fans, either helping them build community so they could communicate back and forth or build business connections so that artists could make money in a direct to consumer context. But this idea of, you know, I guess 15 years ago it was called tribes. You know, that was the yep. big thing. And this idea of like you want the badge for your tribe. Um, it's why people wear T-shirts and hats and buttons and badges. And um, carrying that into the virtual world was something I became a little bit annoyingly obsessed with. And so um, a very old colleague of mine um, had the merchandise rights for Pink Floyd for a very long time and uh, still does. And um, worked with the band for many, many decades. And um, I convinced him, uh, hope against hope, to uh, allow me to put together a virtual goods um, licensing program for the band. And um, and that's what we did. We were, there are platforms that don't even really exist anymore, unfortunately. But um, we did some really interesting things because what was happening at the time was it was all it was. <laughs> It was a replay of the real world where in all these virtual worlds, people were making their own clothing, their own, you know, and their own insignias, and they were copyright infringement was rampant. And so the program we came up with was there was a line of clothing and, and items that we made that were sort of official. But then we also provided a set of assets so that people could make their own virtual goods to sell and make a royalty on. And um, it was a really cool program. Um, it was a little bit of a, I don't want to call it a flash in the pan. You know, I don't think it was, it never really um, became a mainstream product, um, but it was a really cool look. The band were, you know, they were excited because they've always been innovators. Um, yeah, and it was just, it was a cool, fun project. I lost you again. It's because I muted myself so that you, I was, wouldn't uh, maybe heavy breathe into the thing, or, um, <laughs> fighting a little bit of a cold. Uh, but it was interesting to me because, you know, just I do remember, like, I think it was like The Sims. I don't know if The Sims is still around, but they, it was huge when it first was able to do The Sims online. And like, so you didn't have to have the hard disk. You could just download the copy. And like a lot of that stuff lived in the cloud or went back and forth between computers and the Internet. And, that, you know, so I was like, going, this is really, really great. And I guess maybe what has happened is like your idea was right. It was just that the monetization became more difficult because, I mean, I think you can do all that stuff now with like, um, you know, like Snapchat skins and like all these th different things that they have. So I think you were right. It was just that the monetization model, you got changed on, underneath you. Um, but it's still like a really, really cool thing because, I mean, who, who are who what guy or uh, hopefully girl, our age doesn't love Pink Floyd <laughs> at the same time, right? It's like a really great thing. Um, what you said, though, that was interesting to me was two things, right? Which is that you've always been at the middle of the artists and the fans, and then you talked about direct-to-consumer things. And it seems a little bit to me that maybe the next evolution or maybe the evolution that will make things a little bit more sustainable for people um, – over the long term is working more direct to the consumer fans uh, because you build this tribe and tribes. I remember the book by Seth Godin um, that was like really, really, uh, you know, huge in like business circles for a while. Why do you think that, that, or do you think people, uh, artists are doing a better job of going direct to their consumers and building these relationships and maintaining them over time? Or do you think there's like a lot of work that could be done as far as that goes? Yeah, I don't know that I have an either or answer, but what I will say is I think there were certain bands 
that always had a direct to consumer aspect of their business, even though they didn't think of it that way. And, you know, the Grateful Dead's probably the towering model of that with their newsletter list from the early 70s and mail order catalogs and mail order tickets gave birth to obviously Fish, Dave Matthews, um, your boys Pearl Jam, Metallica. You know, this notion really, really took hold with a certain subset of artists and frankly, artists that tended to be part of the community, um, a scene, um, always had um, a, a direct-to-fan connection and, and typically a commercial. So I, I put those bands aside a little bit because um, they were always there and they built a model, but they didn't evangelize it for anybody other than themselves. Um, they didn't, you know, they always said, this is the way we do it. Maybe it doesn't work for everybody else. Um, I think what really started to happen was, the, you know, the two, to me, the two big seminal events are, you know, the distribution capabilities and the communication capabilities of the internet, obviously, you know, the ability for an artist to put up a website and finally have something in their career that was part creative tool, part marketing tool and part demand aggregation. So in other words, you would make a record and it would have music on it and it might have artwork and it might come with cool packaging and you put it out into the world and it was completely different from the marketing campaign. The artists didn't necessarily, by and large, treat the marketing campaign as part of the art. They let somebody else do the marketing. Your website, it's all one thing. It can be an artistic medium. It could be a sales tool. It could be a community forum. So I think that notion made artists start to think a little bit differently about how they access their consumers. But the really big thing was Napster and the sort of rapid implosion of the recorded music business. You know, in the same 12 or 18 month period, you had the biggest selling first week CD of all time within sync. And then you had the bottom just completely fall out of the recorded music business. And those struggles of the next few years which, by the way, the labels have turned around in a masterful way. Um, you know, I think that forced artists to have to be entrepreneurial and have to think a little bit differently and have to think about the other parts of their business in a way that they didn't have to think about before. So I guess it's necessity being the mother of invention and trying to find other ways to, to put food on the table. Because, you know, the popular idea is that these are rock stars who live lives of opulence and have all the money in the world, but not everybody does. And it's a select few and it's the, it's the same 80, 20 and maybe even more extreme that applies everywhere else. And even the really successful people carry a lot of overhead. Oh yeah. You know, they have organizations, they have households, they have children, they have hangers on, they have fears and of the future. And so I think it was, um, you know, it was, it was the digital revolution that touched everything else. And then it was the real specific, issues around um their primary business imploding yeah no that, i mean that, that's a uh, that's a really good answer um and probably you approach it from a way i wouldn't have thought about um because one of you know and, and i was asking it because i have probably two big hypotheses that i come back to or, or questions i come back to over and over again whenever i'm talking to anybody and one of them is just like how can we help make everybody involved in the world of entertainment and tickets and sports and everything better marketers because i feel like so much of uh, so many of the challenges we're dealing with are directly related to either bad marketing habits or 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 just not understanding the importance of marketing and what marketing well looks like and then the other one which is like i don't think i'll bore you with this one is that are people using data the right way which i think they're not um i think they use it to make all their decisions instead of test hypothesis um but that's you <laughs> that's usually the trick question i spring on people and so that's why i was asking the question because i'm always con i'm always really worried that we're marketing in ways that are and building experiences in ways that are harmful to the overall long-term health of the industry. Right. And it's, um, I've taken a lot of heat over the, you know, and until the next tour, I, I won't be proven right or wrong. Uh, because of the, I thought that some of the stuff that Taylor Swift did on her last tour was a little bit, um, her fans were going to react poorly to that over the long term. And so that's why I was kind of asking the question, uh, you know, 
as far as fan development goes and understanding going direct to your consumer and the trust that you have to build with with your audience over time. And then if you break that trust, it often is gone, right? It just doesn't come back. Yeah. The thing I'm curious about with the Taylor Swift, um, the, Taylor, the Taylor Swift sort of model is that, and I don't, I don't, I don't have as forceful of a take on it quite yet developed as you do. Um, for me, the jury's out a little bit because I'm, I'm wondering if it's a generational thing, and that's what, that's what I don't fully feel I have a feel a handle on yet. Is that um, it may just be different now, the same way where the, the generation of music fans that came before us were revolted by the idea of commercials or music being used in movies and TV shows and sponsorships. Mm -hmm. And for our generation, like I've never been to a show, at least not in the last 20, 25 years that wasn't sponsored. I mean, one of the most successful properties going is the Warped Tour. And nobody's ever offended by that. They do a right. wonderful job of, of using branding in a way that adds value to the, you know, it's just done smartly. Yeah. But a generation ago, that would have been shocking. And so I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm a little slower to draw a conclusion on that one because I think maybe I might be a little out of touch with what happened. So, um, no, anyway. that's fair. That, no, that's completely <laughs> fair. I, I, I was just worried more that, and this is, it has nothing actually really to do with Taylor Swift. It has to do with everybody because I see it with sports and I see it with everywhere, which is like, I'm going to sell you a ticket. Lawrence, I'm going to sell you a ticket at a hundred bucks, right? Cause you're one of my biggest, biggest fans. And then all of a sudden Dave comes along. Dave's not as big of a fan, but I haven't been moving that, that there's not enough Lawrence's in the crowd. So I'm going to sell Dave a ticket next to Lawrence for 50 bucks. Um, and, and that, and that's really where my issue with these things come as far as like the monetization thing. I think it, it's great because hopefully it means that some of these uh, sponsorships and partnerships allow more people to see shows more affordably. I, you know, that's what I hope for. Um, it, it's just more like when I talk about bad marketing practices, you know, there's like a um, like an untamed addiction to discounts I see. And, um, and that's what I really saw on like a grand scale with the Taylor Swift thing that made me pause. But you could be right. It could be a generational thing and, and people just don't care, at which point I would be wrong. And uh, and I would um, and I would have to admit that I, if it was a generational thing, that I was out of touch with what the changing taste of consumer habits are, too, which would be bad for the brand. <laughs> well, so we won't believe that, but I think there's other there's some other phenomenon going on, which is when it's an artist specific. Um, I, I'm always empathetic with the artists because. Um, they're not always sure that there's going to be a next time. And I, I don't pretend to be in the head of Taylor Swift or any other artist at any other age range. But I do know there's there's frequently this notion of like we're focused on this cycle. And even though they could be thinking about a brand and a career, so much energy goes into a two or three year cycle um, that – you know, maybe money doesn't get left on the table. Maybe that, 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 that happens. I think where you see it contrasted is in the festival business, the, the festival promoters and, 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 and event producers are some of the smartest, savviest, um, fan friendly, hippest, like innovative, thoughtful people around. They, they think long term. you know, you look at Coachella, this is the 20th year. Um, and I don't think Coachella would have lasted 20 years if they took every dollar off the table every year um, and weren't thoughtful about ticket pricing and scaling and how they integrate sponsors, um, how they develop the physical site. It's different every time you go. Like, and that, and they're they're the they're the crown example of it. But so many festivals operate that way, and that to me is a that's a generational shift that's that's happened through my career that blows my mind. Just the advent and the scale of the U.S. festival scene. Yeah, it's very as we we're even. I don't know if it came out today or yesterday or the day before, but there was like a couple articles about the way that Coachella has continued to innovate with their pricing too, and I, I think it's great because again, it goes back. I think it was. Um, it's a Bill Graham story that Seth Godin shared. And it was like um, they, he asked – I think he met him early in his career and he was asking him, why don't you – you could charge an extra dollar or two more. And he's like going, but if I take every dollar every time, 
who's going to fill my building the next, you know, next week. Right. And it's, and it's the same thing. And I think if you have a bit, a building, you should be a little bit, it's, it gives you the opportunity to be a little more um, conscious of the need to leave a little money on the table all the time. And, you know, it, it is, it's, it is tough when you're put in a position where you don't know if there's going to be a next time, because, you know, those acts are, you know, fewer and farther between the longer we, the further down the path we get to go. But, yeah. And, and tastes change and artists, artists work so hard to stay relevant and stay in touch and stay innovative and evolve as, you know, just creative people. And you never know if that's going to hit with your audience next time. So it's, 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 you know, it's the music business for a reason. Um, oh yeah. And it is, it is tough. I mean, I think uh, people who talk to, I'm sure it, it, it goes to you too, when they ask you and they, they, they like, Oh, you know, like it must be like so much fun and it must be like, everything's like puppies and rainbows and you go like, it's really, really a hard job. It's, um, you know, it is fun, but there, there, it is really, really difficult because you're dealing with probably the, you know, as many variables as anybody, you know, like maybe the only thing that's maybe more tenuous than what people are going to listen to or, you know, go see is like fashion. <laughs> it's like, it's a really difficult thing. And, in that line, I want to ask you a couple questions about your time with Amazon, uh, Amazon tickets, because um, I, I think that a lot of people felt like Amazon was going to have um, the ability to market and sell and, and penetrate the market in a way that um, was going to be transformative. Um, so, you know, and if there's anything that you don't feel comfortable talking about, you let me know because, you know, I don't want to burn anybody or anything. Um, but I'm just I was just kind of curious because I had high hopes for Amazon tickets and. Um, you know, so can you share a little bit about your experience there? Yeah. I, and I, I, I want to, um, be respectful of, um, of, of the way Amazon operates in terms of, you know, they, as an entity, don't really comment on things they're doing or not doing. Although yeah. I, I suppose it's changed a little bit. Um, so I'll give you a couple of different answers. My personal answer is Jesus Christ. It was a fascinating place to work. Like, yeah. Um, I was talking to my, my significant other last night um, on a different but I guess sort of related topic, and we were talking about how there were just some problems in ticketing that um, Amazon tried to solve, and they were able to solve things that were problems for years and years and years, and they solved them in like a couple of weeks because – of the scale and the scale of the talent and the scale of just the raw brain power there. Like I went to work every day and I was like, I must have gotten graded on a curve to be allowed in this place. Um, it was, I mean, it's fascinating people. They're very, very culture and mission driven. Um, it's, 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 it's definitely a bit of a reality distortion field there. Um, you know, kind of insular in a way but so obsessively focused on customer and customer experience. Like it's just a very gratifying and interesting place to work. Um, as it related specifically to the tickets business. Um, I just think it's, I think, I, I don't think they're done with it. I think they're just done with the way we were looking at it because I just saw yesterday they announced an Alexa deal with Ticketmaster for event discovery not sure if it includes ticket purchase. I, I didn't have a chance to look that deeply. But um, the thing about Amazon is they're relentless and they don't think in terms of months and quarters and they don't really care if they get it wrong a few times. And I think there was a sense that our approach at that time wasn't the right one for that time. Um, but it, it doesn't look like they're done thinking about it. I don't have any particular insight into what into what's going on any more than anybody else there or, or a member of the public. But I think that that would be the way I would summarize it is that just version one of the approach wasn't the one they thought was going to lead to massive success. And, you know, and they measure success in ways a lot different than us mere mortals do <laughs> yeah. zeros at the end of success for them than there, than there is for us. Actually, the way you answered it too, was the, it was really what I was more interested in because I expected that Amazon was going to be like, I know how I know some smart. I mean, everybody I know there's like way, way smarter than I am. And I was like, so, and I, I saw like, Hey, you're dealing with these problems that really need to be solved. And I think it as much as anything, right. Everybody's like, well, well Amazon, you know, if you ask people, if you pull them in Intix, I think they'd be like, well, I can't believe Amazon got, you know, knocked out by Ticketmaster and Live Nation and, you know, all these industry people. I think it highlights as much as anything the 
some of the challenges that the industry is dealing with and the need to be more creative and more um, aggressive in the way that we're tackling problems as much as anything. That's, that's the way I saw, um, you know, what happened with version one of Amazon tickets It's you know, it's because I do think that like Amazon has the wealth of data and they have a customer focus and they're, they are relentless in delivering value to their customers that I thought, you know, I still think is key to, um, you know, cracking open the co- you know, the code of selling more tickets, right? Because even if you take out all the tickets are that, ha- that that are sold currently, which is billions and billions of dollars, I think our um, uh, somebody we know, a guy called Stephen Clicken, we were talking about it in, in the pot will go up in a couple of days. There's $58 billion of tickets that go unsold around the world. So there's still like plenty of opportunity to tackle um and sell tickets that aren't being sold. And I, you know, so I, I'm, you know, when I look at Amazon, I'm like going, I, if they can't solve it, then I'm not sure who could. Yeah. I think the two things that, that I sort of, that, that still kind of break my heart that I can't um, reconcile is that one, there is a perception in the industry that, that we failed when really we just, we, we chose to stop doing something that we didn't see leading to, massive scale. Right. right. Um, and the corollary answer to that is that somehow the industry thinks live nation or Ticketmaster were hostile. Um, and I have to tell you, I, I think that people have an incorrect perception of, of that entity because, you know, they're doing a lot of interesting deals. They're doing a lot of interesting commerce partnerships. They're doing, um, this is not an inflexible monolith that, that people are dealing with and they never treated us disrespectfully or fearfully. It was just a matter of like, we have this massive scale business that we have called live nation Ticketmaster. Um, we're not just going to give you the keys to the front door. Like you got to make a deal for us that works. Um, but they never said Amazon, we don't want you in this business. In fact, Quite the contrary. The ecosystem was excited about Amazon coming into the business. I just think that in version one, we didn't have an interesting enough way to do it. Right. So, yeah, that's just my personal defensiveness about it because I loved the idea so much. But I think they're going to figure it out. And I think when they do, Amazon and Ticketmaster and AEG and your local promoter and your local ticket company are all going to make a lot of money and please a lot of fans. And I'll just sit back in my chair and say, well, I remember way back when. <laughs> <laughs> See, and, and I'm, gl- I'm glad you, you, you took the question in that way because that was sort of the thing I was, I was going, hey, look, if you're not trying anything, if you're not swinging – because Amazon has a tendency to swing for the fences, right? Like they go big but because it, it's not worth their time to get into – singles and you know there's like go you know just go for everything you want because if you fail hey it, it really is much invested in, in failing small as there is failing big, big in a lot of ways especially on this scale uh, but, you know and the other thing is is that like the idea that Ticketmaster or Live Nation would be hostile they're in the business of moving tickets they would anybody who can help them move tickets is their friend right it, it's um I've learned that more and more recently. It's like if you if your ideas are helping them move tickets, it's great because there is like still so much inventory that's unsold. So there's a lot of money to be for everybody to make if we can just solve some of the underlying problems, which you know of like helping people find you know find out about events, um, you know pricing them and making them accessible to people, you know uh, creating experiences that people want to to spend their money and their attention on. I mean, you know. If you or I walked into the Ticketmaster office, they wouldn't throw us out if we thought we could make them money. So, so and that's just really the way – that's the way I've found that, that that's the biggest thing about that. But yeah, And you know, and I'll say it one other way, which is the thing that some people view as either hostile or unwelcoming about working with them, it's it comes from them being – I, I get, for lack of a better way to say it, a bit smart and confident about who they are and what they're good at. They know where they need help. They don't need help selling front row tickets to Beyonce at the Hollywood Bowl. They've got that. They can do that all day long. Yeah. They do it at scale. They, I mean, it's actually hard to do, and they do it really well in terms of like the technical infrastructure and getting. And I, I think anybody that gets into primary ticketing is underestimating the challenge. Mm-hmm. But there are distressed inventory pockets and markets and events and other things that 
everybody wrestles with. It's when you walk in the front door and say, give me the first 20 rows of Beyonce and I'm going to go make 10x with it and pay you your normal price that they look at you and say, I'm not really interested. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Which is, um, we talked about this before and I'll let my, I'll say this one. You don't have to say this one. I, I don't want to put this one on you. I'll put it completely on me so that all the hate email comes to me. That's, uh, but it, it's like, that seems to be one of the big challenges that light is dealing with when it talks about shutting down the secondary market a little bit is that the secondary market wants to walk in and go, Hey, I'll help you sell your front row tickets that you're already selling. Um, because I can help. And I always have thought that like one of the really missed opportunities for everybody is like focus on turnover and getting the people into the edges on the, like the distressed areas that, that like, that'll create a lot of money, a lot of opportunity for people. A, um, and it gives people a really like a big hunk of meat to chaw on, I guess, is if we're, you know, for being honest. It's an interesting phenomenon these days that the two portions of the venues that sell out the fastest are the front and the back. It's that fat middle that's really hard to sell. The, the pricing, um, the, you know, the price to value isn't as clear to people. Um, you, know, you get the high roller who, who doesn't have a lot of time and will pay anything to have the best seats. And then you get the average Joe who just wants to go to the show and it's okay paying 50 bucks and sitting in the back. But it's that middle of the room that's really challenging. Um, but, you know, the industry is smart. They're figuring it out. Dynamic pricing is, is I think, impressive yield management. Um, I, I think sometimes it looks like the business is moving slow. But, you know, it's an incumbent business and the incumbents are still there. They've been there my whole career. Yeah. Nobody has truly fundamentally disrupted ticketing. Um, and I just don't believe, I don't believe that that's really where the opportunity is. I believe that there's a thriving ecosystem that is open to new ideas, but they're ruthlessly smart business people. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And I, 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 I will try to do business with them. <laughs> I, yeah, I was going to say, I think that the, the opportunity is not trying to blow anybody out of the water. It's like going, Hey, I see, you know. I'm a, a fairly competent person and I see that you're you're struggling here. I think I have an idea that can help you. And then you show that return on investment and then you know every business every wise business person I've met is always happy to uh, invest in a sharp return on investment. And I think that's um you know that's where everybody should be focusing on not like how can I disrupt something but like well how can I add value? Because Ticketmaster has been around way before probably either one of us, and I'm sure they'll be there way, way after we're we're long gone and sitting on our, uh, you know, sitting on our rocking chairs in the backyard. The one other comment I'd make is um, what you you said about sort of our, uh, you know, lights position vis-a-vis the secondary marketplace. I think, you know, we're not we're not anti anybody. And I think we, we can be accused of having spoken that language at times. And I think we're we're evolving away from that because it's not a very attractive thing. We're not we're not anti anybody. What we are is like we're we're pro we're pro industry and we're pro fan. Mm-hmm. And so what that means is we want to combat fraudulence and we want to combat price gouging. There are very legitimate secondary players who fit into the ecosystem, put money in the artist's pocket serve a section of the fan base to whom pricing is not a object and quite frankly serve a section of the audience where they're getting dirt cheap tickets. I went to go to a baseball game towards the end of this. I won't, I won't name the team cause I don't, I don't know if they like this look. <laughs> I got a ticket about 25 rows off the back of home plate for $13, but I got, I got it on StubHub because that means somebody bought a whole lot of ticket inventory for that team through the whole season and priced it like a portfolio. And they made a lot of money at the high end of the portfolio. And then they had a lot of chaff they just needed to get rid of. And that last week, you know, that last week of games when the team was out of contention and a lame team was in from out of town, that was a cheap ticket. And I got to go to a game. So the secondary provides a really valuable role. I just think the way it's going to evolve is, the primary rights holders are going to get smarter and smarter about clawing more of that revenue back directly into their own pockets. Yeah, and and I you know, even my comment right about the secondary market is in no way, shape, or form because anybody who's listened to this thing for any period of time knows that like some of my greatest uh, successes and projects has been on the with the secondary market. Um, it's just more that I explain I try to explain it to brokers and 
you've explained it as eloquently as I ever could that, you know, you have to look at it from like, where can I add value? And you have to manage it like a portfolio and you have to always be looking for ways that you can create differentiation for yourself. And, the, you know, the way you described it is exactly how I tell uh, brokers to approach it if they want to be uh, in the business for the long term and be a valuable part of the industry and the ecosystem. It's not just going as the example I used of, let me help you sell your top, your first 10 rows of seats because nobody really needs to help with that, right? It's just, that's not the case. Uh, maybe you gain access to some of that stuff by eat, eating a lot of the other stuff and helping distribute a lot of the other stuff, but that's a different thing. You know, just coming in and like having it be completely one-sided is just not an effective way to to do business and people are smart enough to know that. So but that's yeah, in general, you know. having a sense of entitlement won't get you far. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're both very entitled people. So <laughs> well, <laughs> if anybody I, I, who's seen us, <laughs> or at least, you know, also very serious about ourselves. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. yeah. No, that's exactly. That's it's a good taken point. on me enough times. I figure I may as well just do it myself. Yeah. Head it off. Yeah, I, I figure I, this is my way of putting it. Is like if, if there's a joke to be told about me, I'll go ahead and tell it and get it out of the way because it's totally <laughs> fine. Um, but Lawrence, how can everybody find you on the internet here? Well, pretty much every social media platform, I have the same username, which is Lawrence Purrier. Lawrence with a W, L A W R E N C E P E R Y E R. Um, there's a LawrencePurrier.com, which is basically my resume. Um, but yeah, I'm around, I'm on, you know, Twitter, Instagram, not on Facebook anymore. I'm on LinkedIn, um, L at gmail.com. I'm, I'm always, I always love to talk to anybody who wants to talk. I love to banter around good ideas. I love to get pitched. Um, I love to get criticized. I love to have my, a beer bought for me. Um, <laughs> if you buy me two, I'll buy you one in return. Um, but yeah, I, I would, I would love to hear from people, especially if, uh, there was anything we said here that excites them. Yeah, it's Lawrence's very own happy hours. You buy him two, he'll buy you one. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, Lawrence, thanks for doing this, man. All right, Dave. Thank you for having me. Once again, I want to thank my guest, Lawrence Purrier from Light for taking the time to speak with me on the Business of Fun podcast. As always, you can find out what I'm up to by visiting my website at www.davewakeman.com. You can also follow me on Twitter, at David Wakeman. Remember, if you know the person who has the at Dave Wakeman um, Twitter handle, tell them to let me have it. I really want it. I'd love it if you'd connect with me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, I'm also going to drop the audio of my free webinar. I'm going to start to do some more webinars soon. I think they turned out very well, but look for that also in your podcast app. As always, if you have some thoughts, ideas, questions, concerns, suggestions, for guests. Email them to me. My name, Dave, at DaveWakeman.com. And if you like what I'm doing on the podcast, I'd love it if you'd subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and leave a review. This stuff helps, uh, makes people be able to find the podcast more readily, and it helps ensure that I can continue to deliver really great uh, content for you. One final ask if you've liked any of these episodes, if they've been valuable to you, would you please share with just one person? I'd love that. It would be really, really helpful, along with leaving a review or subscribing, all of those things. I, mean, I really do value your attention. And finally, I want to thank my sponsors, Booking Protect, the global leaders in refund protection. To find out how you and your organization can partner with Booking Protect to deliver world-class customer service to your guests, a better more customizable buying experience and how you can generate a new source of revenue for your organization, visit www.bookingprotect.com, the global leaders in refund protection. Until next time, thanks for being here. I'll talk to you soon. Take it easy.